Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. I'm an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. I also direct the bioinformatics program in the MGH Department of Surgery. I'm a Sloan Leadership Fellow at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where I'm completing an executive MBA. And all of this is really just to say that I'm, I'm thrilled to be in a, in a room here with senior healthcare leaders from many different industries like uh, academia, government, healthcare, uh, uh, um, venture, uh, and, and so forth. So I think they, this idea of collaborative innovation that the World Medical Innovation Forum is all about is really going to help uh, my projects move forward and all of the first look speakers' projects move forward and really put healthcare in a better position years from now, which I think we're all hoping for. So um, what we're working with in my group is uh, really to uh, address the problem that we can sequence genomes at a staggering pace right now. We can genotype uh, hundreds of thousands of patients, but uh, the uh, and this has led to a number of genetic clues in, in uh, neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, in psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia, ADHD, uh, and autism. In metabolic diseases, there is vast insights from genetics in type 2 diabetes, for example, in cardiovascular disease, early onset myocardial infarction. Um, but really, it's become a key bottleneck in the field right now to interpret the genetic data and, from, and to move from genes to pathways, and perhaps even more importantly, from uh, genes to therapeutics. So this is the bridge that my group is trying to address by using computational and experimental approaches, and by leveraging certainly artificial intelligence to really uh, comb through these incredibly complicated uh, data sets that are emerging now. So uh, the way that we're trying to address this is based on the insight uh, that, that genes, uh, somewhat remarkably like people, like to work in groups. They, uh, they affiliate uh, with other genes in these in incredibly social networks uh, of genes. And if we had perfect social networks of genes in a cell type specific manner uh, and in a disease specific manner, we would be able to, to integrate the genetic data. We, we call this, we would be able to constrain the genetic data on these social networks of genes. And that would immediately lead to pathway insights into these uh, incredibly biologically complex diseases. The problem is we don't have those, uh, that information about the social networks of genes. So what my group has been trying to do over the last decade is to compile the largest such network that exists by integrating data from more than 40,000 articles uh, and really trying to piece together a lot of information that's out there in the literature about how genes interact with each other, how they form pathways, and also in pathway uh, definitions that don't fit the conventional mold of what we see in textbooks, uh, like the Notch pathway, the Wnt pathway, and so forth. So this is a project that we published as a resource uh, last January in Nature Methods, and this has been used extensively by the pharmaceutical companies in the Boston area and also uh, the genetics community worldwide uh, to interpret genetic data sets, which is quite gratifying for, for us, of course. The, the flip side is that these networks are so complicated that just having a network isn't enough. You need to develop artificial intelligence methods to comb through those networks and find signatures in the genetic data uh, that's, like I said, constrained on this network information. These networks have tens of thousands of genes, obviously, and they have millions of connections between those genes. So finding these incredibly subtle patterns requires a large computational effort, and we're really trying to drive uh, the development of those kinds of tools. We've recently published, or it's actually impressed right now in Nature Methods as well, an algorithm that we call Quack because it's an artificial intelligence method that uh, scans these networks for signatures in the genetic data and says if something walks like a pathway and talks like a pathway, it's probably a pathway. That uh, was a name that someone in my group who has a pretty good sense of humor came up with. It's a little bit of artificial intelligence uh, humor for you right there. Uh, but uh, so, so we try to have fun while we're developing these methods as well. Uh, obviously, uh, I've been giving presentations on this topic for uh, a number of years now, and I realize these are abstract concepts if you don't think about them every day. So I'm just going to try and walk you through an example in one disease where we have applied these approaches, uh, and this is in, in cancer. Uh, so in cancers in particular, we're also seeing a, a wealth of genetic data right now. And, and while I'm showing you this example in cancer, it's important to recognize that this is a generic example. You could do the same things for type 2 diabetes, early onset myocardial infarction, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and so forth. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that on the last slide. So um, in the cancer uh, project, we used the fact that 4,700 cancer genomes had come online uh, recently from the TCGA project, or the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, we developed an algorithm that was inspired by Quack, but it was modified to analyze the cancer genome data sets uh, and really scanned through these 4,700 cancer genomes to find social networks that were particularly enriched for genetic risk. And those social networks pointed us to 62 genes that had not previously been implicated in cancer, suggesting they were flying under the radar 
of, of conventional approaches. Obviously, these are computational predictions, so we want to make sure that they are real and that they're not just false positive predictions by our method. So we were incredibly fortunate to be able to leverage the, the, the very rich uh, ecosystem of Partners Healthcare and talk to collaborators at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and also at the Broad Institute at MIT, uh, or at least at Kendall Square, which is a collaboration between MIT and the Harvard-affiliated hospitals. And they had uh, developed what we call a massively parallel in vivo tumorigenesis assay, where we could deploy 32, 33 of the genes we had predicted and compare their tumorigenicity to 25 known oncogenes as a positive control and 79 random genes as a random control. Turns out that the genes we had predicted through our method uh, were as tumorigenic as the known oncogenes and that the random genes did not induce tumors in these mouse models at all. So that was very gratifying, certainly hinted at uh, the, the quality of the predictions that we had made. But of course, we wanted to take it back to patient material. And again, we leveraged the incredible wealth of the uh, Partners Healthcare ecosystem by talking to uh, our collaborators at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. They had access to a cohort of lung adenocarcinoma patients. And lung adenocarcinoma, like many other tumor types, uh, we, we know of the oncogenes that are mutated in about 70% uh, of the patients, but in 30% of patients, we still don't know what the genetic cause of their cancer is. So we decided together with Matthew Myers in there to specifically scan the, these unexplained 30% of patients for mutations in the genes that we had identified. And it turned out that two of our genes were significantly amplified in that specific subset of the, of, of the patients, uh, which again confirmed our predictions were true in real patient material and explained 10% of these patients that uh, at that point really uh, we didn't know what the genetic cause of their cancer was. So I think there are a number of ex exciting insights from that. One is that we found new cancer genes that explained a pretty large fraction of patients that we couldn't explain before, that's great. But really what's exciting to us uh, is that those new social cancer networks that led to the prediction in the first place, um, they uh, immediately offer hints at new combination therapies and sp patient-specific uh, target uh, drug target opportunities that we didn't know about before. These were completely uh, unknown cancer pathway uh, uh, connections that we use to, to identify these genes. So, so to us, that's really where we're moving now with these predictions. Uh, and, and, and I think the fact that we immediately have mechanic, me mechanic, mechanistic insight from our predictions is incredibly exciting. So in terms of next steps towards commercialization, we've already licensed uh, a lot of our technologies uh, to pharma companies. We've spun them out to, uh, to, to biotech and bioinformatics and translational genetics companies earlier. And we really do have unique and protect protectable insights because uh, a lot of this, the things we're doing can only be done in this rich partners healthcare community because we have access to patient material, brain power, institutional funding, uh, these uh, massive assays like the, this in vivo tumorigenesis assay that I talked about where we used uh, tens of mouse, mice, we actually used uh, almost 100 mice to, to, to do these experiments. So, um, uh, so that's very, that's incredibly unique and a, a real opportunity of our approaches. Uh, there's, we immediately get new mechanistic insights because these social networks offer uh, targeted and cost efficient uh, follow-up hypotheses and diseases that we've leveraged now several times to find new pathways, new regulatory mechanisms involved in both cardiovascular diseases and also in cancers. And I think what is very exciting for me on the horizon is that uh, there's a perfect storm right now of enough genetic data that artificial intelligence approaches are being able to interpret these incredible, uh, incredibly large and complicated data sets. Uh, and also that's something new, which is that stem cell models are coming online at a scale so we can produce, for example, human neurons in the billions. And we can now move from using the in-web uh, more general protein network where we've scanned data and downloaded it from the internet and, and stitched it together into this huge social network. We can really take a much deeper dive by uh, asking for the social networks of schizophrenia genes, for example, in human neurons at scale. So this requires the production of billions and billions of human neurons. We're currently producing uh, uh, quite uh, um, routinely billions of neurons for these experiments. And we're doing the same things in other cell models that are relevant for type 2 diabetes, uh, early onset myocardial infarction for cancers, for Alzheimer's disease. We've started a project uh, where we're hoping to use microglia cells uh, so that's really, for me, this, uh, the next horizon for these types of approaches. And obviously, uh, since all of the data in these new projects we're generating ourselves together with collaborators in our community, these are proprietary uh, data sets that we have access to. And that it turns out that approximately 90% of these social relationships we're seeing when we're applying the cell type specific models are new and not published in the literature in any formal way. So there's really a wealth of new data coming through the gates. Uh, based on the, the fact that we, uh, we can leverage all these three technologies together. Um, 
I, I'm incredibly excited about uh, talking to everyone here in the room about our approaches, uh, getting your insight based on your seniority and your uh, just insights into many different uh, parts of the industry and, and the thought process of healthcare. So I hope uh, I'll be able to have conversations with many of you later. And I want to thank again the organizers for giving me an incredible opportunity to speak here and, and uh, I look forward to seeing the other first look uh, presenters as well. Thank you very much.